It's my absolute pleasure to now invite uh, panel one to the stage. Uh, Tatnan, please um, rejoin us on stage, and I would like to invite Dr. Phillips Vermont, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Indone Indonesian International Islamic University, who is joining us from Jakarta. We do not hear enough from Indonesia. I'm very pleased that, um, Phillips, you've joined us today. Hosok Lee Makiyama, Director of the European Centre for International Political Economy, who is joining us from Brussels. Professor David Cappy, Director of the Centre for Strategic Studies, now a trustee of the Foundation, who will be moderating this morning's Panel One discussion. And Sir Hasni Haider, Diplomatic Editor of the Hindu New Delhi, India, who had planned to be with us, but India is undertaking a somewhat historic visit to Pakistan for the SCO. Um, so she has had to um, uh, stay in South Asia, but she has kindly recorded her um, contribution to the panel. Um, so all four will be making a valuable contribution. Um, David and the team, the, the floor is yours. Well, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Morena, now my haere mai. Uh, as Sue said, my name is David Cappy, uh, and I'm the director of the Centre for Strategic Studies here at Victoria University of Wellington, and it's my, also my great honour to be a trustee of the Asian New Zealand Foundation. Can I start by wishing the Foundation a very happy birthday, and it's lovely to be here to celebrate this uh, very special occasion. Um, this first panel is charged with uh, getting us to think about some of the big trends that are shaping our region uh, and our diplomacy, uh, to shape, uh, that are shaping the Asia-Pacific region or, uh, as Titanan said, the Indo-Pacific region as we think about it today. And I think we can all uh, acknowledge that the region uh, that we live in is undergoing some profound and unprecedented changes. And I think Titanan painted a, a very vivid picture of some of those shifts in his opening keynote. We can think about huge, unprecedented shifts in the balance of military power that we haven't seen in decades. Much sharper and confrontational relations between the US and China that are playing out with consequences for everyone and that now seem not so much as a phase but something that is almost baked into the structure of regional politics. But the region isn't just about the US and China, as we often sometimes fool ourselves thinking uh, about it, that there are many other rising regional players as well. We can think about evolving diplomatic, security, and economic frameworks, the growing number of minilateral frameworks that, that Titinan alluded to in his remarks. Very different politics around trade. Um, think back to the origins of the foundation in 1994. That was the year of the Bogor Declaration, when APEC announced that we would have a free trade area in the, in the entire Asia Pacific by 2020 a high point in some ways of, of tr optimism around trade. And then we can also think about the disruptive impact of technologies as they are playing out across our region. So to help us think about um, these big trends, these big shifts, uh, and, and others uh, from different places across the region and across the globe, I'm really delighted to be joined by four outstanding regional experts uh, on, on the regional politics each offering their own different area of expertise uh, and insight. Suze has already um, provided a, uh, their bios. They're in the full full bios are in the program, so I won't repeat those. Um, but I will. Um, but I will start by asking uh, if, uh, unfortunately, as, as Sue said, one of our visitors is unable to be here, Suzanne Hyder. Um, but perhaps we could start with Suzanne's uh, remarks and play that video, please. Hello, namaste, and greetings from New Delhi. I'm Sahasini Heather, and I really can't be sorry enough that I'm not joining all of you for the Asia Summit in person. And I'm so grateful to the Asia New Zealand Foundation for allowing me to join you in this way. Now, we're looking today at the big trends shaping the Indo-Pacific. And I plan to really break up my remarks into three parts. I'm going to look at the big trends that I see in the region that you and I occupy, 
the specific challenges for India, uh, as well as the Indian Ocean and South Asia, and finally, the five-year term, what we should worry about and what we can look forward to. So to start with, if we were to look at the big trends that really are shaping the Indo-Pacific, as it's known, of course, as we know that until a few uh, years ago and maybe a few decades ago, it was only the Asia-Pacific, but it is that maritime sphere that has now captured the global narrative. So to begin with, when we're talking about the trends, unfortunately, and maybe it's because I'm a journalist, so I see things this way, uh, the big trends tend to be some of the more difficult trends that we are dealing with. The first is the constant shock. I think you and I have seen in the last few years, just in this decade of the 21st century alone, the idea that there is a constant shock coming. We don't know where the next one is coming for, from, but we have seen the COVID pandemic. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, terror attacks in Israel, and a year of bombardment of Gaza. Each of these has put massive new pressure on our economies, on food, fuel, fertilizer sources, as well as some of our connectivity plans. India, for example, had really looked forward to just a year ago at the launch of the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. That's something that has now been put uh, at least on the back burner while the conflict rages. Uh, so it's not possible now to plan as much for the future as before. The second big trend that one sees is the retrenchment of the world order. The fact that the United Nations is really not seen as effective and also that it remains unfair and unrepresentative of most of the world. The UN Security Council, for example, doesn't include India, but it also doesn't include Africa, South America, or Oceania, where all of you are. Uh, apart from the retrenchment of the world order, we're also seeing a certain uh, disbalance in the kind of involvement of some of the global powers like the United States. And of course, elections coming up there may change that idea even further. The third big trend is the rise of China. Of course, we have seen the rise of China. Many celebrated it around the world for decades when it was an economic rise. But I'm speaking about the rise of China in ways that threatens and frightens neighbors. We've seen this in the South China Sea, as well as the continental ways at the line of actual control that India has been speaking about, as well as the resultant US-China rivalry that has come from there, uh, which at the bare minimum threatens the world with a new Cold War and all uh, the problems that come with that. The fourth, I would say, is the age of alphas. Uh, in the old days, I used to say it was the age of alpha men, but I'm told that isn't gender sensitive at all. But I'll put it this way, leaders behaving badly. Uh, alpha leaders who don't care about universal declarations of values or of the need to maintain global order. And we have seen that kind of behavior all the way from Russia and Israel to China to Myanmar uh, to Afghanistan and many other countries around the world. So what does all of this mean for India? The challenges really are multifold because of India's unique positioning. Uh, you know, I remember hearing a, a lecture by an American professor who quoted somebody else saying, that, you know, whatever you say about India is true, but the opposite of that is also true. So India has this unique positioning, seen as a place perhaps where the East meets uh, the West in some ways, but also where the global North meets the global South. Um, look at some of the areas you see that. One, India is the largest country by population, but it is not a world power yet. It doesn't have a space at the UN Security Council, uh, also G8 and other such groupings. Second, in New Zealand, you may see India as an Indo-Pacific power, essentially from uh, the maritime sphere and, of course, given the small amount of water that separates us. But in fact, the bulk of India's military resources are really positioned towards its continental boundaries, of course, with China and Pakistan as its biggest threats. And that's something that decides a lot of India's foreign policy as well, uh, given that the entire hemisphere, if you like, uh, above those uh, two countries also are not exactly in the, they're, they're all seen as counter Western kind of countries. At present, of course, India appears to have a foot in each boat, the Western and the counter Western in the quad with Australia and the US and Japan, but also in the SCO uh, with Russia and China, Central Asian countries, Iran and Pakistan. Uh, another SCO meeting is the reason I can't join you today. 
Uh, India is also a member of the BRICS, emerging economies with also Brazil, South Africa, Russia, China, the UAE, Saudi Arabia and other such countries. But then it is also a part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum, which is led by the United States. It's now a member of uh, groupings like the Mineral Security Partnership, which I know uh, New Zealand is not uh, right now. Uh, but India also has close trade with non-MSP members as well. On one hand, India is opening up its markets, looking for new investment, uh, looking for new FTAs, signing new free trade agreements. But at the same time, India did decide also to walk out of the 15-nation RCEP. Uh, FTA some years ago. Uh, so there are a lot of contradictions, a lot of conundrums that come with India's position. Then there is the problem of what I call the buffet versus the a la carte issue. That in an increasingly polarized world, it is no longer possible to pick off a menu uh, according to your needs and say, I will take a plane from you, but I will take a tank from you and maybe I will take a technological uh, innovation from you as well. Look at radar systems from another country. Uh, it's not just in fact for defense, but also for all technological platforms that are being built. Uh, so you have to take from one area or the other. Uh, this is of course a choice, uh, a problem that has become a problem for the Indo-Pacific region as well as the US-China rivalry, the US-Russia rivalry increases. The fourth challenge for India really is its own neighborhood. It's really often seen as a ring of fire with problems in each of the countries in India's neighborhood and consequently sometimes problems between India uh, and its neighbors, some more than others. But in the last few years, we've seen radical changes in the regimes in Afghanistan where the Taliban came in, Myanmar where the junta took over, Bangladesh where there was a people's protest uh, and a complete change of regime. Uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, all of them have seen these massive protests on the street. And there is a sense of instability, not just in those governments, but also in the relationships in the region, which has become uh, a sort of cause for concern for India. The fifth, I would say, is not just as an analyst, but as a journalist uh, with some firsthand experience of this, is the idea that in India, democracy and diversity are both under pressure over the past decade we have seen an increase in authoritarian figures, not just in India, but around the world, who believe really in a majoritarian, more muscular, more homogenous, a less diverse narrative. And that has led to many fears about the state of India's democracy, because of course, India's perhaps USP, if you like, the cause of India's goodwill around the world has often not just been about its market or the size uh, that India represents, but the fact that it is a uniquely pluralistic, multi-ethnic, diverse, egalitarian, secular, rule-abiding democracy. Uh, if there is a question over any of those values, obviously there are concerns about where that's going in India. Now elections in India this year did throw up mixed results. As a result, Prime Minister Modi's party lost its own majority in parliament, but it remains in power in a coalition. And that itself has given many uh, some, uh, some more space. But the trend, and not just in India, as I said, around the world, is still a worry. So let me tell you what else I am most worried about. And we were asked to look at a five-year term. I think the first worry is really a further disintegration of the post-1945 world order without an adequate replacement for it. That propels to repeat the wars and the destruction of a century ago. So that really is a priority, finding ways of making those areas of global governance uh, revived and, and refreshed and actually bring them new, uh, newer constituents perhaps. The second is the increasing politicization and the polarization of everything. This has meant a big divide across the world in areas like trade, investment, energy, technology, uh, even things like media, music, literature, uh, a dance in the last few years, particularly after the Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, we have seen it possible for one area to ban these in the other area, just depending on which side of the divide you are on. These are dangerous cleavages because they also then cleavage other areas of global governance. The third is the idea of the GDP, the gross domestic product as your only measure of growth uh, and then it meaning that we have to find some way of just growing 
year upon year upon year. Unfortunately, as the economies have uh, faced a different kind of strain, what we're seeing instead are the trends of jobless growth, uh, of artificial intelligence coming in, of anti-immigration trends, climate change creating climate refugees, all shrinking the place for livelihoods. So what we're going to have to look at, and I don't think that's just in one part of the world, around the world, everyone is going to have to look at more bottom-up approaches rather than bottom-line approaches towards their economies. In fact, countries like Bhutan, in the Indian neighborhood, and New Zealand may actually lead the way to a more sensible path, uh, looking at smaller ways of uh, naturally sustainable uh, paths. So what am I most excited about? Of course, it's here where the countries of the Indo-Pacific, this grouping that want to defend themselves without being drawn into the great power rivalries and instead uh, look at their economies, prepare their populations for other future challenges, they can work most closely together. India and New Zealand may have nothing in common in terms of size, but they do in terms of spirit and their concerns for the future. So let me tell you what I'm most excited about. I have like three things. One is the renewable surge, uh, the idea of non-fossil energy using earth, wind and water, looking really at more traditional methods of sustainability. Uh, these are obviously a strength for New Zealand. Uh, it's something that everyone around the world, I think, admires about New Zealand. It's also a place where old practices in India need to be revived. One project in the region I'm watching most closely is the Bhutanese plan uh, for the Gelafu Mindfulness City, and you could look it up. Uh, it's supposed to be a carbon zero smart city using renewable energy to power health, education, wellness, high-tech industries, uh, maybe even some crypto, and it certainly should be interesting. Uh, I'm excited about the next generation of leaders. They're all about 25 years old. Um, these are people who have learned resilience during the COVID pandemic. They're less interested in owning and acquiring. They're happy with looking at virtual worlds with renting and leasing instead. Uh, and I think I'm really excited about the new impetus to globalization. Globalization may have benefited many, but it does need some rationalization especially given the, the political twist we've seen in the last few years uh, with global supply chains in, in particular, as well as, of course, the high carbon emissions cost of transporting each and every small part from around the world. So we need to look instead at local productions, local sustainability, closely work instead uh, more perhaps on the import and export of ideas, of innovation and cutting edge technology. I'd like to wish you all the best for an enriching days of just such ideas. Namaste, kakite, and thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Suhasni. For uh, uh, we are really sorry that you can't be here in person, but I think you'll agree that was an incredibly engaging, stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, it was also quite sobering uh, across uh, some of the many of those themes, uh, and in some ways picked up, I think, from from Titanan's keynote, some of the real challenges that are that are out there in the region and challenges for a small, open trading nation like New Zealand. Um, I wonder if we can, in terms of format, for the three um, speakers who we have with us in the, in the chamber today, I'm going to ask them each to speak for about 10 minutes on what they see as some of the big uh, trends and trend lines from their particular perspectives, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion and try and make this as conversational and interactive as possible. I wonder if I could first turn to you, Hosuk. Um, we've, heard, uh, we've heard a, a lot of... Uh, uh, worrying trends, particularly in, in the first two speeches, the the, uh, the extent to which the region has become a the key concept has become a security concept in the Indo-Pacific. The challenges around protectionism, um, the uh, disruptions to patterns of trade, whether through the pandemic or, or interruptions to um, to supply chains uh, through conflict. How do you see the big economic trends playing out across the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific region? Well, we live in very worrying times. And I think perhaps the most worrying part is the overuse of the word trends. <laughs> um, I, I must admit that I personally don't believe in trends. And not because I'm a, not a trendy person, but uh, trends tend to mean over-exaggeration of certain tendencies that you see in the current 
which you extrapolate and you apply to the future. And if you look into your past, you will see that history has always moved in zigzags. It's never been a linear curve. And I look at the history of New Zealand and see so many turns and key points throughout its life and also for the foundation, happy birthday, um, that I don't know why we suddenly believe that there won't be disruptive events, especially when people are talking about disruptive events. <laughs> Hence, I will refrain from talking about trends. I rather think about the current times and what we see ahead of us as a game of chess, perhaps, um, a chain of reactions, counter-reactions, or almost like a catalytic event of chemicals. It's a very toxic cocktail, that's for sure. Um, and also, I don't believe in trends because I see certain things that are fairly constant. There's not that much that we should be over-interpreting. Let me explain. If I look at, for example, the, uh, the gallery of personality and foreign policy that we have in front of us right now, uh, it's very easy to overplay the importance of characters and especially politicians, with all due respect, uh, tend to overplay their importance. I tend to think more that interests are more constant and interests form politics and politics shapes politicians. And anyone who played a good game of cards or good round of diplomatic negotiations know that you can only play the cards that you've been dealt. And I must admit that the pause looks very, very bad for most people around the poker table at the moment, and which makes it, of course, quite a worrying time indeed. But perhaps the most important part here is that the concept around some of the terms that we have now around the new Cold War or the systemic rivalry is somewhat failing on its own premise. First of all, many of the analogies that we hear around Cold War and the, the parallel to the 1980s really don't hold up because we actually don't have anyone, at least not in China, who wants to impose their system upon us. There's a different kind of rivalry, the old-fashioned commercial one, over market share, over resources, to a certain extent also over influence. But we are not fighting an ideological war anymore. I think that's very important. And... We are, when we talk about rivalry, it implies that there has to be some kind of shortage, and some, like market share, and also territory. And this has also been fairly constant. If you open up a Chinese textbook today, you'll find that it has many of the elements that has been a standing feature of Chinese textbooks in geography for the last, let's say, 60 or 70 years, which is basically that it's one third of the territory that it's supposed to have, and the time is really on the side of China, which basically means that one day it will be at its right, right, righteous, I'm using air quotes, you can interpret as you like, but um, the righteous place in the global governance at some point. And uh, yeah, but it's not just China that has territorial disputes or in rivalry or more over market shares. I mean, let's face it, if you look at this region, I think it's only Mongolia that doesn't really have a, a territorial dispute with anyone. And uh, Brunei might be the other one as well. Um, but we are looking at economic statecraft increasingly because the world that we defined it around, let's say, the 2010s, where Hillary Clinton famously said that economics is in the heart of foreign policy, it also means that there is nothing much else that we can do using or projecting our economic power. There is not that much else. That, well, no one is really interested in a full right land war across Asia. And if you're not going to over fight over territory, the only thing you have left is basically market shares. And, um, yeah, uh, I don't know where to start really on, on, this, on this thread, but what we heard in the previous intervention over, um, well, the the ominous threat of war and conflict. I think also it's worthwhile sometimes to walk in the other guy's shoes. And um, 
if you look at some of the conflicts we see in the South China Sea, uh, you can see define it as the, uh, the revanchism and the revisionism that we talked about before. But it's also possible to look at it the other direction and see that the Chinese are actually sipping somewhere close to half a trillion uh, dollars worth of critical inputs and materials and exports through the South China Sea. They do want to have a stake in how that part of the world is controlled. And one thing that they do not have at the moment is control, which basically means uh, China is perhaps the most cornered power in the world at the moment. And that's perhaps not the popular view that we have currently in the press or in the media or the popular debate. Uh, we tend to think China as a rising power. But if you follow the Chinese discourse, some part of course that is true about China dream, etc. But I think we also tend to forget that the ones that we do with the worst hand in terms of game of poker that I was talking about before is perhaps United States and China. And the other thing that is remarkably similar and constant uh, is also the centrality of Indo-Pak region. I'm not saying this just because I have a slightly European accent and I work in transatlantic relations and I want to be nice to the host. This is really the truth when it comes to the fact that the future is in the Indo-Pak region. But that's partly because if you look at Middle East and the Eastern Europe where the, the big conflicts are at the moment, these are compartmentalized regional conflicts and which has absolutely no upside for anyone on this side of the world. Anyway, uh, I see the sign for three minutes. I'm going to start to wrap up, although I haven't actually even come, started to come to my point. I, I realized I've digressed, but I'm perhaps the only one in the panel who has traveled more than 35 hours to get here. Uh, so I apologize if I take another minute of my time, but this is not a great time for the moment because of the, the poor cards that has been dealt. There are major constraints on political capital and domestic politics. Election years are usually not a great year on fertile ground for diplomatic cooperation, especially not economic cooperation. And even though you may not have major decisive changes in political inclination of any of the countries that we have seen, not least in the United States, which if you look at it, Biden has conducted basically Trump policy across the board on not just in trade policy and security, but also in things that really matter, like fiscal policy. And ultimately, none of the positions in the Indo-Pacific has changed. Japan remains an ally of the United States and there is nothing that's going to change that. That basically brings to my conclusion that the only thing that really matters in the Indo-Pacific is actually ASEAN. <laughs> they are the only ones who haven't actually taken a position. And uh, well, in terms of instrumentation, nothing changes that much either. Uh, neither United States, uh, either party of the US politics believes in ASEAN or TPP as an important instrumentation because neither of the US parties actually have any patience. The only one who actually believes in that track at the moment is the TPP members themselves and potentially China, which is kind of ominous. And as a token economist, uh, I should perhaps also say a few things about trade, although I understand that uh, there's not much interest in trade policy at the moment. And rightly so. Um, there is no real export-led growth out there. There is no incentive to do a very expensive trade deal. Um, and if you consider the fact that the counterpart will have their hands tied, there's very little they can offer. In other words, there are no good deals on the table at the moment. And uh, if you look at the, the, growth, uh, the big growth engines, even the Chinese internal demand has started to slow down, uh, which basically means with the inflationary regime uh, that we have across the world, anyone who's going to try to grow themselves through export is probably slightly delusional or potentially a trade minister. Yeah. So, and it's understandable, therefore, that everybody look for industrial policy and trying to look at productivity growth and infrastructure investments 
And since a lot of things that we are doing or have been doing in the last 10 years in terms of cross-border trade-offs, whether in the area of security or economics, they can't be explained at the moment to the public. And even if you do, and if you have a very sensible population like you have in New Zealand, it's not always going to be sure that it's going to make sense. I'm going to wrap up here. And uh, there are a lot of other things that I could have and should have said, perhaps. But I'll just give a heads up and say that this is not a trend. This is a one-time transition that we are going through. And we are returning to the normal. And my favorite filmmaker, Whit Stillman, always used this analogy of the people who were born in the 1950s and the 60s, who was a part of the hippie generation. They thought free love and the whole concept of global peace was the norm. And when the 1970s and Nixon returned, the world was actually turned up, well, right side up, but in that generation's view, it was actually turned upside down. And this is perhaps what we're experiencing now. And since 2016, we have basically lived our own alternative history. This is, we are living our own counterfactual. And there's very little ahead of us that is going to change our trajectory. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Hosuk. Um, in your comments, you've said really, you, you made the comment that really all the, that's left in the Indo-Pacific is Southeast Asia. Uh, and so let's turn to uh, two speakers from Southeast Asia. Um, Phillips, first of all, if we can turn to you. Um, Indonesia is New Zealand's closest neighbor in Southeast Asia. Uh, it comprises 250, 260 million people, with about 40% of the population of Southeast Asia. A vibrant, young democracy with a new president. Hosuk said that, uh, you know, this is a game of poker and nobody's got a particularly good set of cards in their hand at the moment. What does the region, what does the world look like from Jakarta at this moment in time? All right, thank you, David. First of all, thank, uh, congratulations to the foundation for the 30th anniversary. Um, <clears throat> I was planning to talk only about Southeast Asia, and uh, it's a it's, uh, coincidence that Horsuk <clears throat> mentioned about the, the importance of Southeast Asia. Uh, I have about five points to make <clears throat> in this regard. Number one, I think in the past one decade, <clears throat> ASEAN has been struggling to put itself at the, at the center of this new or old geopolitical rivalry between the U.S. and China. Um, so much about the principle of ASEAN-centered uh, processes, and then the ASEAN-centered uh, management of great power rivalry and uh, external power uh, in Southeast Asia. But uh, in my view, in the past one decade or so, ASEAN has been defined less and less by Southeast Asia. It's defined by either the US or, or China. And I think uh, if you look at the, uh, the way ASEAN come up with the ASEAN outlook of in the Pacific, it took a long time, <clears throat> and then the, and then what what entails in the document, it's only a, a broad outline and not so much about what ASEAN can do in this uh, uh, Indo-Pacific and geopolitical rivalry, and uh, it is sad to say that uh, ASEAN has been, in my view, uh, less proactive, partly because of democracy. Um, in the 70s or 80s, ASEAN was run by autocrats, strong leaders who stayed in power for a long time. So they were able to easily gather and found temporary solution for conflicts. ASEAN was uh, the principal actor, for example, uh, in managing the Indochina conflicts and so on, partly because, you know, Suharto, Mahathir, and uh, Marcos and others could just uh, pick up the phone and talk to each other easily. But since 90s, we had successive government, uh, thanks to democracy. Uh, but then uh, we have a less and less uh, interaction between leaders in, in Southeast Asia. And then the, at the same time, ASEAN is, uh, we have to acknowledge ASEAN is 
less institutionalized. It's not a conflict resolution organization. Right? It's managing conflict, but it's not finding solution uh, to many extent. That's my first point. Uh, second point, in the Southeast Asia, and uh, maybe in many other parts of the world, what we've seen is, uh, and I agree with Titinan uh, during his speech, uh, we've seen less multilateral <clears throat> uh, and diplomatic uh, gathering of countries, but rather we've seen the increasing uh, influence of minilaterals and bilaterals. And this is partly, uh, once again, because of the rivalry between US and China. When they are engaged in trade uh, war, for example, they're not deciding to go to WTO. They, uh, they try to solve it between the two countries. So if the two superpowers, if you will, are not believing in multilateral institutions, then in many other cases, a less powerful country would not also believe in multilateralism. And I think this is what our speaker, first speaker, <coughs> was saying that our leaders especially in, the, uh, in big country act uh, in a less <clears throat> a responsible uh, manner in the past few years. Now, <clears throat> um, number three, uh, in Southeast Asia at least, we've seen uh, old conflict, traditional conflict of, as you know, uh, territorial uh, overlapping claims emerge. This is not new. <clears throat> South China Sea has been a problem for a long time. And there are countries who are facing uh, overlapping uh, territorial claims, and it's hard to solve. But <clears throat> in my view, uh, the way ASEAN uh, manage uh, South China Sea has been very, very slow. Right? And uh, uh, partly, this is maybe an uh, unpopular view in, in Southeast Asia and even in Indonesia. I think. What we need is uh, more uh, socialization with China. Uh, because if China wants to be a superpower, it has to provide international public goods, i.e. security. Uh, great powers are measured by their ability to provide international public goods. Uh, the US has been, done, has been doing that, and China, <coughs> uh, to my knowledge, has never been in that position, uh, at least uh, when it comes to conflicts in Southeast Asia. What we are expecting from the view of uh, middle power or less powerful countries uh, is that <clears throat> uh, great powers should be part of the solution, not part of the problem or the ones who initiate problems. And when it comes to South China Sea, uh, clearly uh, China is part of the problem. And uh, the problem in South China Sea, I think, reflects as well the fact of uh, how we should view international law. Um, <clears throat> uh, China is not part of uh, China is part of the UNCLOS, UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, but it acts like it is not part of the UNCLOS. While at the same time, the U.S. is not part of the UNCLOS, but the U.S. has been acting like it is part of the UNCLOS, calling every countries to play by rules-based order uh, when it comes to South China Sea. Which one is the prime rules-based uh, in the management of the sea? It's UNCLOS, while the US is not. So this is, I think, uh, problems that are faced by less powerful countries when it comes to uh, international law. But then I think we need to socialize China, socialize China and <clears throat> make them continuously, and this is the ex expertise of ASEAN, socializing for how many meetings you don't know. Uh, but uh, we have to keep doing that uh, and uh, convince China that actually, in my view, South China Sea could provide a, a platform for China to show the world, at least Southeast Asia, that uh, as a superpower, it can be a responsible one. And uh, it can be a model for uh, conflict resolution if China would one day really become a superpower. Number four, we have, while the old problem exists, we have new problems. As uh, <clears throat> our previous speakers have noted as well, we have pandemic, we have climate and tech problem and so on. But the underlying problem for, for Southeast Asian countries in these new problems is actually governance. 
uh, when you're talking about climate preparation, you need transparent democratic governance. When you're talking about technology, and even uh, during the pandemic, now, for example, what we've seen in the region, uh, at least in Indonesia, post-pandemic, is that we have bigger government, uh, where government has become very strong. Because during the pandemic, it's the government that can only provide you know, subsidies, even vaccines, and so on, and people are becoming less and less uh, <clears throat> uh, influential in the eyes of the, of the government. So governance is uh, the, the issue in, in, in at least Southeast Asia. And with that as well, uh, this is very uh, challenging situation in, in Southeast Asia, in my view, because at the same time, in the midst of this geopolitical rivalry, actually Southeast Asian countries have the momentum to, to develop. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, Indonesia grew 4%, 5%, and then uh, many other Southeast Asian countries keep growing. But at the same time, your choice increasingly becoming limited because of this uh, geopolitical uh, tension. So development, I think, is uh, one of the key issues that are faced by the, in governance, faced by Southeast Asian countries. And the U.S. Uh, has been run in the principle of three Ds, if I may, defense, diplomacy, and development. With defense, of course, um, probably defense is still one of the <clears throat> uh, age of the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but in terms of development, China has been catching up, providing development assistance, a charm offensive in Southeast Asia, while the US is increasingly inward looking in that sense. And in terms of diplomacy, uh, we know what happened during Trump, uh, uh, government uh, less popular in terms of diplomacy uh, in many fronts and climate and so on and so forth. So in these three areas, I think uh, these two superpowers have done not much in terms of uh, relations with Southeast Asia. <laughs> and lastly, uh, if I may, if I'm uh, going back to the, the first point that I make that ASEAN has been struggling to put it at, uh, at the center of the <clears throat> uh, international relations in the region, if you will. Number one, I think countries like New Zealand and others can help ASEAN uh, to improve its institutional mechanism. Uh, uh, right now, <clears throat> uh, in the economic realm, you have this principle of ASEAN minus X that you can minilaterally, you know, start doing things together. Uh, and then other countries would join whenever they feel they're comfortable with the pace, uh, their own pace. But in terms of political and security, the consensus principle is really, uh, can hijack the overall uh, ASEAN positions towards South China Sea. So finding <clears throat> a better institutionalized mechanism in our, uh, Southeast Asia, in ASEAN is uh, key. Number two, um, I, I start to, in, uh, to think about the value of fence-sitting uh, for Southeast Asian countries. Because, uh, you know, it, it, it has been seen as a uh, irresponsible uh, behavior of states, but I think what ASEAN and Indonesia, uh, to, to a large extent, to be a fence-sitter, uh, in this geopolitical rivalry uh, actually helps slowing down the tension between these uh, two uh, great powers. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's uh, the same uh, course of action has been uh, taken by the other uh, big countries like Nigeria, uh, South Africa, and, and Turkey to some extent. So fancy thing maybe we need to think more about right, in, in order to slow down the tension. Uh, and then, uh, in, in, in terms of the state-led geopolitical competition in the U.S. and China, I've seen less and less track two or track 1.5 interactions. And uh, I think this is the uh, area where uh, ASEAN New Zealand Foundation could fill. We have been in the business of ASEAN ISIS, for example, but, you know, it's slowing down. You know, we have less meetings, we have uh, less interaction. And uh, think tanks at this time, this time, I think we need uh, the participation more than ever. Uh, last, I agree with Horsuk that uh, we have to see uh, this superpower, China. China is a developing country. I think we, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, China is busy feeding their 
1.3 billion people. So war, I think, in my view, uh, less of the option that Xi Jinping and other decision maker would want to make. And India, the same thing. So much about uh, making India the balancing power of, of, of China and so on. But India is busy feeding its 1.3 billion people as well. So these two <clears throat> big power in, South, in, in Asia are actually developing country. And I think uh, more developed countries should see this from this perspective of developing countries um, as well. I, think I should stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Phillips. <clears throat> Um, Titnan, I wonder if I can ask you to maybe to pick up on some of the themes that, that Phillips identified in that. Um, you've written extensively about Southeast Asia's relations with both the US and China, and it's always interesting. I know one of the, one of the um, events of the year that always attracts people's attention is the publication of the annual ISIS uh, survey of, of attitudes towards those, those big powers um, within Southeast Asia. But you've also written a lot about ASEAN's performance, inc including quite critically, and about needs to, to rethink about the working of, of some of those ASEAN arrangements. Um, how, would, how do you respond to, to those comments, particularly about the, the need for a shift in institutionalization and also this idea about that ASEAN can somehow socialize China in, in, in disputes like the South China Sea? Thank you. Um, ASEAN's divided, uh, split on a range of issues. I mean, US-China, South China Sea, um, on Myanmar, on Russia, Ukraine. Uh, so US-China, you basically have uh, Cambodia and Laos uh, as a kind of, uh, if I may say, um, client states of, of China. Uh, and then uh, you have the Philippines as the outlier on the other side, uh, confronting, standing up to China uh, in a really a military confrontation. And then on Russia, Ukraine, I mean, Vietnam and Laos have consistently abstained from the major UN condemnation uh, resolutions to condemn Russian aggression. On Myanmar civil war, uh, after the coup in 2021, February 1st, um, you have uh, on one side um, Indonesia, I, I would say in, in, in order it would be Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Philippines uh, calling for restoration of uh, democratic rule. And you have uh, on the other side a uh, muted uh, response from uh, Cambodia and Laos and um, Vietnam and Brunei and with Thailand in the middle with the elected uh, government now in Thailand. They're coming around to the uh, the, the, the pro-democracy, uh, restoration of democracy side. So very much split. And the, and the reason it's split is because of this US-China uh, confrontation and conflict. I want to just go back a little bit, uh, expand on the, the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific. You know, if you look at, in a broad sweep, so I'll just talk about two things. I mean, one is a big picture, what's happening. And uh, two, only two points, is a, a small, more specific a uh, conundrum of uh, what should countries like New Zealand do about what is happening. If you look at the broad sweep, you know, if you can fast forward from 1648, Westphalia, to, 19, to 1815, um, after the Napoleonic Wars, and you can fast forward to uh, roughly 1914, uh, the Great War, and 1917 is a key, key date, the Bolshevik uh, Revolution. So I see the 20th century continuing into the 21st century. The Asia-Pacific era was just an, a kind of a, an aberration, a bookend, an interregnum between these two, uh, the conflicts that we're seeing. It's basically the continuation of the Cold War. It's not the new Cold War to me. I mean, if you look at the, the communist, you know, uh, ideological expansionism, uh, the Soviet Union, what the Soviet Union did with the United States of America, the US, they had a confrontation. And it was a decoupled confrontation. The Soviet Union had its own system. Military pact, the Warsaw Pact, the Comic Con, the economies. And um, they were siloed, there were two separate systems, East, West. It was a military confrontation, but it was indirect between the US and Soviet Union. Indirect meant it was fought in proxy wars in you know, the third world, um, say Nicaragua, Cambodia, um, and so on, uh, Angola. Uh, so Soviet Union lost. 
1990, we had a, a good run of the Asia Pacific era with the hyphen for about 25, 30 years. At that time, US China were very close. You know, China used to have to ask, to ask the US every year for MFN. And then 2001, they joined the WTO. The US was the biggest supporter of Chinese entry into the WTO. And you think, wow, how can these two countries now be so at odds, uh, have this conflict, technology, trade, you look around, it's just about getting, approaching military conflict. Um, if you look at South China Sea, Second Thomas Shoal, I mean, the US is backing, upgrading the Philippine Alliance in confrontation with China. And China knows it. Um, so I see this as a continuation. Con Continuation, not as a kind of a break, not a new Cold War, but you know, just a, a bit of a, a separation, a bookend during the Asia Pacific era, peace, prosperity, a lot of trade, APEC, and so on. And now you have China. Now, what's happening with China, I think, if I were the Chinese, it's their time. This is China's manifest resurgence. There's a sense that it's, it's inevitable that China would rise up one day after being a great empire before. And there's a sense of entitlement that they have the right to do so. If you were them, you know, it makes sense to them. And if you look at the Belt and Road maps, the Belt is the old Silk Road from a thousand years ago. You know, the, the Belt is on land. And the Maritime Silk Road is actually the Zhang He's expedition uh, from 600 years ago. And so the Chinese, you know, it's not illogical uh, that they had a claim, kind of a uh, reclamation of glory and greatness from what they had before. So this is kind of a, a manifest resurgence. Um, now, you can ask also, if the US is such a big promoter and supporter of China to join the WTO, when did this conflict start? I, I have actually one um, you know, of my classes, we had talked only one thing, when the US-China conflict started. And there's no consensus. Some people say 2008, I mean, for me, maybe 2012 roughly certainly coincided with the Xi Jinping's uh, ascendancy. And then the launching of the Belt and Road 2013 and so on. And now the confrontation is it's like a Cold War, you know, it's back to the Cold War. It's the same Cold War. China is the successor state to the Soviet Union. Russia has become the residual state to the Soviet Union. You look at the communist China, it's a centralized political one-party rule, just like the Soviet Union. The profound fundamental difference is that the Chinese have adopted market capitalism and they're fully enmeshed in the world economy, but in a Chinese way, with industrial policies, with state-directed development. And uh, that is something, you know, the confrontation, US-China is, is direct, like the Soviet Union but it's so far non-military. It's direct, but it's trade and technology. The Soviet Union was military, was indirect, fought in the third world. So that's why now we, I think we see this era of the Indo-Pacific because the US is pushing back. It knows China is uh, trying to supplant um, uh, the US and uh, the Chinese also know that whatever they do, uh, the US will not accept. So I think the trend is, you know, I mean, not to use the word trend, but the uh, direction of this conflict is not, it's not a good omen. So what should uh, a country like uh, New Zealand, uh, is, is a big conundrum. I mean, a country also like Thailand, but Thailand, if it can get the domestic act together, it has a good, uh, good assets and capital to work with because it has really good relations with other great powers and so on, good location within ASEAN as well. Um, so for New Zealand, this is a, you know, back in the Cold War with the Soviet Union, uh, look at what you did. You, um, you know, you part of the Western Alliance. New Zealand, I think the dilemma and the conundrum is like a, it's a Western democracy located at the outskirt of, the, of Asia. Because you have values, the country is set up like a Western country, uh, it's in the OECD, you know, it's, I mean, it's a parliamentary democracy, it's deeply entrenched, consolidated, and, and it looks a little bit similar to Australia, but it's just a different location. It's not over there, it's over here. 
Um, so it's a big conundrum, but also it would be for ASEAN as well. In US, China go at it like this. We'll see increasing decoupling, you call it de-risking. Um, but you know, the Soviet Union and US began decoupled already in the beginning. China, US began as enmeshed and now decoupling. So you can see fewer flights going to China. Fewer Chinese will be, you know, will be going to the track too because they can't get visas. And, and, and so on. So now for a small country like um, New Zealand or us, uh, Indonesia is a big country. Uh, Indonesia, I think, uh, with the new president, I think will be a bit more impatient with ASEAN, in fact. And I think, you know, you call it ASEAN minus X, I think it's uh, passe. I think now it's, uh, my own view is ASEAN five, original five, plus X. Depends on what works. Um, but for New Zealand, I have two ideas. I mean, I have no solution to know. Uh, but one is, you have to stick to your guns, which means it's still a democratic country. It's Western-oriented, and you know, it's located over here. Uh, so you can't really betray uh, who you are, the DNA, um, where you stand, uh, place in the world. But how you navigate then, you have China. You know, we're used to having China next door. And you know, I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, criticism, skepticism uh, towards China from here, and you get this in Europe, you get this in America, but for uh, some ASEAN countries, we, we are very used to putting up, living with China next door. Um, so I have two ideas. One is uh, to look at third ways, third, third, uh, the third way in the different minilaterals and, um, you know, there's a, there's NATO, there's OECD, and then there's the BRICS uh, that the Chinese and the, but also Indians, but also the Russian, the Ru Russia chairs it now. It's like BRICS plus now, and it works on this global south, south, south. You know the G77, comprising 134 countries. Um, but there also are many laterals involving, centering on ROK, Republic of Korea, Japan, some India, some Indonesia some ASEAN, and that's really the, the constellation that New Zealand has to look for ways to, to not be shackled and uh, forced into this US-China uh, binary or duality uh, structure, conflict and confrontation. Um, that's one. Uh, second, just an idea, you know, maybe New Zealand needs to uh, and I think that the resources will be limited and so on, but look out into the world into new frontiers. I mean, Sir Don McKinnon mentioned Africa last night at the dinner, uh, welcome dinner, and, uh, but also Latin America and other areas. And, you know, being, I mentioned earlier, nimble and nifty and niched, uh, but maybe not stuck in the same constellation, expanding the constellation and shuffling the constellation a little bit in order to handle and cope with this, you know, US-China uh, conflict which, which will get worse and it could lead to a real military conflict. Um, I don't say that in a deterministic way, but you know, if you look at the, uh, all the various trends, uh, we could not use the word trends, but the dynamics, um, you know, it's, it, it's heading in that direction. Chinese, the Chinese won't back off, the US won't back off, no matter who comes to the White House. And for countries like us, uh, what do we do? Um, I mean, you know, I, I said to Thailand, you know, we have to get now act together at home because this is a critical time abroad. And if we do have our act at home, together at home, Thailand can do a lot to, to be a bridge and broker of these, uh, uh, these tensions. Um, for New Zealand, I think the home front is the most important. You have to have the home front in, in order to gather good and right. Because the challenges from outside uh, will be even more pressing uh, and worse than even during the Cold War before. So on that note, you know, uh, a lot to think about, maybe new frontiers, uh, different minilaterals, third way, not just US-China. Thanks very much, Titanan. Um, some 
Wonderful points there, and I think that question of the home front and thinking about uh, New Zealand's sense of itself uh, in relation to, to Asia will be something that I think some of the subsequent panels will, will touch on later in the day, a really important point. We have uh, a little over 20 minutes for, um, for Q&A and discussion. Um, I'm going to get out of the way of the talent and just go straight to the floor. Um, could I ask you please, uh, if you try and catch my eye, uh, I'll be happy that we have some roving microphones uh, and they will come to you. Um, if you could please uh, make it a crisp and concise question and not a lengthy soliloquy. And if you could perhaps start by uh, introducing yourself very briefly. So I've got over here John McKinnon. Thank you. I'll, I'll stand up just to make it a bit easier and I'll try and be crisp. Um, there's been a lot of talk about China. I'm the chair of the New Zealand China Council, amongst other things. And I'd like to ask about two, I'll call them realities, I won't use the word trends because that obviously has been put out of court. One is that China's there and it's going to be around and it's not going away. The second is, is there's a lot of anxiety about it. And some of that anxiety, at least from what Ho Suk said, is actually maybe in China itself. And so my question, and it's primarily maybe to Dr. Phillips Fermonte, but I'd be happy for the others to contribute, is how do those two realities, the fact that China's going to be around, the fact that there's also anxieties about it, how are they going to play out? I won't say over the next 30 years, because that might be a bit of a stretch, but maybe over the next five years, which is, I think, the period that uh, you have all been given to consider. So that's my, my question. How does, how does the region whether we call it whatever and nomenclature we use, how does it manage these two realities, China as a, a, a presence and China as a country, which often people are rather anxious about? Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, in order to answer the question, uh, if I may uh, rephrase what Titinan has said, I think we in Southeast Asia, we are less nervous about China. Um, because you know, we've been dealing with China for thousands of years. Right? Uh, but <clears throat> uh, China's uh, model of cooperation in, in Southeast Asia is um, basically state-led. And uh, things, uh, people think, uh, tend to forget that uh, U.S. private sectors remain very robust and active in Southeast Asia. So... <clears throat> You have these two different models of, you know, uh, uh, involvement of China and the U.S. Uh, in in Southeast Asia. So for that, again, to emphasize the the point uh, in Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asia, we are less nervous about China because we've seen uh, these great powers come and go into the region. And secondly, <clears throat> I think uh, again, when it comes to development, uh, China is certainly at least until before the pandemic, <clears throat> is a, a more liquid country, if you will, you know, when it comes to development assistance. And of course, uh, it's persuasive towards uh, South, uh, many Southeast Asian countries because <clears throat> we are in need of development. And then uh, uh, China comes handy, partly because it's not a democratic country. Uh, Xi Jinping could just wake up tomorrow morning and said, I'm going to give Indonesia $10 billion. Uh, he need not go to the parliament and so on and so forth. While for the US uh, and others, European Union or New Zealand, you cannot do that. And, and that's why uh, then China has become uh, very attractive, but it comes at a cost, right? Uh, you've seen a lot of studies about the, uh, the implementation of Belt and Roads uh, and or what are the negative impacts here and there. Number three, why we are less nervous and why I was saying that we need to socialize China in the context of Indonesia. Um, we froze our relationship in 1965 after the uh, failed uh, communist uh, rebellion in Indonesia. And then we opened up the relationship, diplomatic relations in 1989. So, Right now, in my view, in Indonesia, uh, most people are thinking about China in the 1960s. While China has changed a lot, China now is not China in 1960s. So, uh, to put it bluntly, uh, the U.S. is the devil we know, right? 
China is the devil, we don't know. So that's why when I'm saying the U.S. is devil, meaning uh, uh, the U.S. is predictable because we've been knowing the U.S. and their policies for a long time. So we more or less know what, uh, how U.S. would react in certain situation. But when it comes to China, because of those 30 years of absence of diplomatic relations, we really, in my view, do not know China <clears throat> in Indonesia. That's why, uh, and probably they don't know us as well. I'm specifically talking about Indonesia. And this is a concrete example. There was a trade fair in Shanghai or Beijing a few years ago. And Indonesian delegates go there and the first question they asked was, do you still hate us? Right? Because of 1965, Indonesians blame China Communist Party for what happened in the country. So, and this is 2000. 15 or 2014, if I'm not mistaken. So that's why I think we need to socialize more and more. And, uh, and we are not less nervous about uh, China, I would say. Thank you. Sitna. The question has to do with uh, you know, China as an as a opportunity and, and risk. Uh, and uh, you know, I think uh, we have the same mind here uh, with uh, uh, Philips that uh, you know, if you look at the what China can offer, can't turn it away. I recently took a ride on the Chinese train in Laos, and you know, it's a very, uh, it's a smooth ride, it's a great system. And now you have it in Bandung, you have it coming down to uh, Northeast Thailand. So infrastructure, BRI, uh, tourism, uh, number one tourism uh, source is uh, China in many uh, Southeast Asian countries, including Thailand. Technology, um, trade of course, uh, so the, the opportunities are immediate and, and visible and readily available. Uh, on the other hand, there are some risks. Uh, you know, China certainly wants to expand its influence and uh, dominance even. You know, we mentioned, I mentioned the belligerence in the South China Sea, building upstream dams on the Mekong River unilaterally. Uh, these, are, these are risks. These are uh, geostrategic risk and also a, um, a kind of a behavior that uh, uh, reflects uh, Chinese uh, uh, intentions. Down the road, I think the Chinese are doing themselves a disservice and it comes down to this. I mentioned a little bit about autocratize, autocratization and democratization. You know, they don't engage with civil society. Chinese diplomats don't go to receptions. Uh, well, they're very busy with bilateral meetings and so on, and you know, have a lot of delegations, but um, they don't engage with uh, civil society and you know, these kind of exchanges unless it's transactional. Why? Because these uh, the, you know, professors, they don't make decisions. They have no power. But in the longer run, the party that won the election in Thailand last year that was dissolved, um, you know, subverted, it's not very favorable towards China because a lot of young people across Asia, reflecting in the Milti Alliance, for example, see China as a supporter, promoter, uh, back uh, underwriter of autocratic regimes. So in the longer run, I'm just thinking beyond 10 years, uh, this is China's weakness and um, they don't realize it. But the thing to do for a country like New Zealand is to keep promoting the young, the youth, the exchanges. Those are, you know, they, they are small issues, right? Um, but keep the eye on that ball, because in the longer run, in the long game, I think the Chinese uh, have a lot to, to answer for, for a lot of young people. Yeah. Um, I think it was a very good question, and I'm going to try to answer it as best as I can, which is not going to be very good, but I'm going to try to make an attempt. Um, <laughs> Seen from a Chinese perspective, are they happy with the current situation? Probably not. They are a revisionist power. But they are also, at least between the US and China, China is the one that is perhaps more happy with the status quo. But there is a number of reasons for that. But if you think about what China can deflect and not deflect, China is not very happy with a world where G7 is in charge or even G8. They hated G8, especially when Russia was in it. Uh, they are perfectly happy with 
G0, which we all thought the future would look like, if everyone remember the book Post-American World, we thought that no one would be in charge and there would be some kind of a happy equilibrium. That didn't happen. G2 is their, perhaps their ideal outcome, which basically means that United States and China is basically de facto, believe it or not, in charge. They have a single currency around the dollar. Uh, they have more or less the best free trade order, or the biggest free trade order imaginable. Uh, I, for one, have always said that you know we could get a little bit more interest for the WTO system if we renamed it free trade agreement with China or everyone else that we don't actually want to have a free trade agreement with. I know it's a mouthful. Uh, it's almost as mouthful as my name. But if we rename the WTO to that, I think we could get some interest into that organization again. But I think there is a great deal of danger for New Zealand and for others to believing that status quo could prevail just because that's something that China could be advocating for. Ultimately, United States and China has moved on to a post-MFN world. They have both set up system in order to make sure that they can give preferences. They can give, well, it, it's not just about trade preference, but also in terms of security preferences they have moved beyond the multilateral order. And believing that we can go back is perhaps one of the most dangerous paths you can go down, and that's the European approach, which is governance by through nostalgia. Um, you're not supposed to laugh at this. <laughs> and we also heard about, um, I was particularly troubled by some of the uh, comments around the UN system and the Security Council, because I think that there is a great danger in believing that the global governance is about, and especially a global governance that involves China, is about proportionate representation. That's not how international relations works. It's actually about who is underwriting it. I don't see India willing to underwrite the system. I don't see Europe willing to underwrite the system. I don't see ASEAN as someone who's interested in paying for other people's benefits. In other words, what I'm trying to say here, outside of the United States, and potentially China, everyone is a free rider. And I say that with a large portion of self-criticism and also lack of ability, mostly lack of ability, at least when it comes to my European background. Uh, so I think it's very important to bear in mind that if we actually want to be in charge, we have to underwrite something. Uh, one point I also want to point out is that um, we already talked about trends, and sorry I killed that off within the first minute of this game, but uh, I don't see necessarily Chinese stability as given. They have a transition in power in 2027. And I wouldn't count on Xi Jinping's fourth term as entirely given for reasons that are currently hiding behind the noise. Uh, China is not a constant. We all know it's not a monolith. And we can be very critical about China's central governance. And I, for one, would think that it's one of the biggest dangers that we have. But also, if you look at the alternative, it's not that great either if we would see China balkanize and decentralize. Uh, one of the dangers here, in particular in terms of trade and economics, is that if you look at all the market distortions that we see from China, they're not necessary. Well, with the exception of this week <laughs> and the big fiscal package that they put on the table, most of the distortions are still on the province level. And uh, if you look at the compliance of China with the WTO rules. And I say that as someone who participated in China transition review of China's WTO commitments when I was a lowly uh, trade official uh, in Europe. I will basically say that China actually has a track record that's absolutely comparable to the one of Europe's. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I've got Suze here. Yeah, thanks for the superb commentary throughout panel one. Um, my question is on the rules of the game. Um, countries of our 
size and military strength, which is we are less military strong than Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, etc. So we really need the rules um, to operate in the world. And I was in China recently and was really struck by the select application of law, um, a very different argument to what is right, um, and and kind of came out feeling like it was a, a parallel universe. And on some of those points, um, China was, as you have all noted, unmoving in the same way that the US is on its perspective. Um, but there's very little leverage in this order and high vulnerability to small countries of, of say, economic coercion to our interests, to our resources, and so on. Um, and there's a risk that, as you've noted, small countries, you just get sort of written off as a client state of one of the other, as Cambodia and Laos have, for example, been described. So how do you sit on the fence and stay economically viable and secure? Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to have a go at that? And maybe we'll try and make these some just quicker uh, answers and then we might be able to get one more question in from the floor. <clears throat> That's a tough question. Um, I think as we all struggle with, uh, struggle to come up with solid China policy, uh, that's a very <clears throat> relevant question to ask. Uh, you mentioned about the, I think it's, China has a completely different culture. Uh, and uh, uh, China has been a communist country for many decades now, and, and before China has been the, a, a power <clears throat> that uh, has their own system and so on. So going back to my point, uh, that's why we do need really, really to socialize uh, with China in order to shape their behavior. And uh, uh, to <clears throat> some is uh, <clears throat> critical of this view, saying that you, know, you cannot change China's leadership thought. But <clears throat> uh, as, as uh, I think China uh, would feel, for now, for example, Who's China alliance? No countries would defend China, in my view, when the, probably Russia or North Korea, but the others would not you know, uh, defend China if uh, they are engaged in wars. Uh, which means right now, maybe Cambodia, Laos are, are under the influence of China, but I don't think uh, they would defend China uh, when worse comes to worse. Meaning, <clears throat> Uh, they are in need of, uh, you know, uh, m m winning the hearts and minds uh, of, of many countries. If I may use the example of Japan, uh, I use this example many, many times. When, when Japan uh, developed quickly and uh, in the early 70s, uh, Japan faced the same situation with China right now. Uh, Japan's investment went all over Southeast Asia and many other countries. And what happened? There were riots in Southeast Asia. In Indonesia, in Jakarta, huge riot uh, in 1974 against Japanese investment. And same happened in KL. And I think in Bangkok, uh, there was uh, the same incident of people <clears throat> protesting against uh, massive Japanese investment and saw them as uh, intrusive. Uh, to <clears throat> domestic uh, politics uh, within these South Asian countries. But what Japanese did uh, was different from what Chinese uh, is doing right now, right? Uh, Fukuda doctrine came, 1976, right after these riots. And in the Fukuda doctrine, <clears throat> uh, Japan understood that what they need to do is really to winning the hearts and minds. So from, from then on, they established this uh, Japan uh, cultural uh, engagement with Southeast Asia. And right now, Japan is the most loved country probably in Southeast Asia. China has yet to learn this, that you know, uh, it's not only about the economy, but it's about cultural as well. And uh, so again, in my view, there, is, there are more benefits in socializing China because Japan, we see that with Japan in 1970s. This is purely perspective from a Southeast Asian. First, I would say, um, you know, the, the challenges outside can be leverage uh, for inside. Uh, so at home, I think it's always important, I mentioned uh, uh, earlier that, you know, to have the unity, the consensus at home. 
And I think that uh, uh, the internal peace, social peace, is necessary in order for New Zealand to engage outside. So that can be used, I think, the other way, to maybe remind uh, New Zealanders that you know the world outside is uh, uh, is tough and rough, and that uh, it's not a not a time to uh, to be divided at home. Second, you know, the alliances and um, what we might call multi alignments. New Zealand is not going to be muscular uh, militarily like uh, Australia, let's say. Uh, Australia now is a very straightforward middle power with muscle, and um, they have clear intentions. Um, for New Zealand, you know, you're looking at alliances and multi alignments. Uh, Towards the middle powers, I think, I mentioned earlier, ROK, Japan, some ASEAN countries, ASEAN 5 especially, uh, India, uh, some, and then, um, you know, within that mix um, is a way of kind of uh, staying on your toes and shuffling and moving along with uh, uh, the, the, the various challenges as they evolved. I think New Zealand has to get its relationship with Australia, uh, you know, Right, which means that uh, it has to define, you know, what is the role. Uh, when I was in Japan or Korea, they always talk about deterrence. Uh, that's not going to be the talk around here. But what is a uh, Australia is a key relationship. I think New Zealand might think about recalibrating the U.S. relationship. Um, you know, because uh, there are some tensions in the past, but uh, now the U.S. is uh, very assertive and resurgent, and I think that they will be more aggressive. Uh, and then, of course, New Zealand needs to um, maintain its relationship with uh, uh, China. Uh, I think not to alienate, but you know there'll be things that. Uh, so for us, you know, uh, we're very accustomed. But for New Zealand, I think there's some thing about China that they cannot get round. Um, so those are the relationships. I also mentioned earlier about new frontiers, possibly, but another new frontier would be uh, the UK. You know, so in the in that mix, uh, without building, uh, you know, a lot of uh, military budget and uh, muscularity uh, alliances, multi alignments, um, especially with the middle powers. I think this question is about the enforcement, and I'm going to give the simple answer, perhaps on trade, because I already said. Well, if you have China and United States basically moving on from the rules, there is no enforcement, and this is the reality we live in. And to be fair, there is a good reason why they have moved on, and to a certain degree we have moved on as well, because when we designed the WTO system, uh, we couldn't invest, envisage a state capitalist model like China. At best, we had something that looked like Singapore, and if you multiply by that by 10,000, you're still not close to what we are having on the China at the moment. So it's not so much of a lack of fantasy, but perhaps a lack of foresight <coughs> that something like this could pop up. And also, if you look at the rules, it was basically designed to keep Eastern Europe, which had just liberalized from the communist planned economy and basically tied to the mast. It was actually more designed to keep Europe on track than envisaging that there will be a lot of transitional economies would move in to the emerging market bracket. We just didn't see comment. So lack of foresight, and I think that's something based on the conversation we also had or just now and yesterday about Africa, it's worth taking into account. We are building the infrastructure of tomorrow in today's rules. And uh, I would like to say a couple of critical words about plurilateral, because I think this is one of the biggest contributions by New Zealand. You have given us some of the best ideas uh, that is available on the table. And you have also given us, you've been very generous enough to give us some of the best people uh, who are here in the room, and including one guy who just came in. And. Um, I must say that this is perhaps one of the biggest contributions that has been made to the multilateral order. Uh, but there's also natural limitations on how far you can go, and one of them is about enforcement. It's basically a coalition amongst willing. And, but we also forget that if you look at the design of the WTO system, the coverage of the WTO when it was created is roughly the same as TPP plus United States. The system was a plurilateral even the multilateral system was a plurilateral in the beginning. 
uh, I don't think there's a good way to get around it because if we would start, start negotiating about everything about economic security, critical raw materials, and all the difficult things that we omitted in the Uruguay round. I don't think you will come up with very good rules at the moment. I think this is perhaps one that we have to put in the freezer until we have a little bit more policy space to come up with a better foresight rather than focusing on too much of today. And there's also another element that I want to talk about in an area where there is no enforcement, which is in the area of security, because the topic also about maritime borders have come up. And here's where I think the key question around foresight really matters as well, because we can be very critical about China's practices, and we are, that they are not respecting international rules. And their answer is always going to be yes, but we learn from the best. We learn from the United States. We are only behaving in the same way as the United States does. And there is no way to get around that answer. And in other words, we have basically shaped the China we want to have, and therefore they have just adapted to the world that they have grown into. And I don't want to see that mistake happen again. Well, thank you very much. This panel started 10 minutes early. It's about to finish exactly on time. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the we, we, at the beginning we talked about the Foundation's mission being to uh, improve New Zealanders' understanding of Asia. I think if nothing else, this panel has reminded us that that has to be something of a constant work in progress, that we're not talking about a region that's monolithic and unchanging, but in fact one that's highly dynamic and is changing in really dramatic ways that, that all three panellists spoke to us. Uh, Huge, uh, huge challenges, and we can be left with no doubt about that. But I think we had a great survey, if not of the key trends, certainly the most important themes, uh, and it set us up really well for a great day of discussions. Please feel free to carry on the conversations over morning tea, but for now, please join with me in thanking our four speakers. Thank you.